Welcome to another curatorial chat here at the Walters Digital Space. My name is Joy Davis and I am the Manager of Adult and Community Programs here at the Walters Art Museum. My guest today, I'm so glad to welcome, is Ashley Dimmig. She is the Wheeler Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow of Islamic Art here at the Walters. This afternoon, we are gonna be talking about textiles, but more specifically, we're gonna focus on Islamic textiles. And I'm so excited to talk about textiles with you today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to echo the work that we are doing both internally and programmatically at the museum to combat anti-racism at all levels. And with that, I want to thank Ashley here for uh, speaking with me today and being here. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Joy, happy to be here. And I wanted us to start off with just if you could give us a intro into what is the Islamic textile collection at the Walters and uh, maybe give, showing us a few examples. Yeah. Um, well, our Islamic textile collection is pretty amazing. I've been exploring it a lot lately. We have around 300 carpets and textiles from the Islamic world. And that actually takes up about 25% of our entire collection of Islamic art. So it's a really big chunk of, of the collection. Um, and as you see from these beautiful details, they really represent a range of materials and te techniques, but also cultures and peoples and times and places. Um, unfortunately, they're rarely on view because textiles are quite fragile and light sensitive, but uh, we're in the process of updating their cataloging information and having them photographed so that hopefully we can soon share them and make them more accessible online. That's wonderful. That's a great initiative that we yeah. are undertaking as a museum. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about how this work was acquired by the museum? Yeah, well, so the Islamic collection uh, was really begun by Henry Walters. Uh, it was through his interest in the ancient Near East that he got interested in the Islamic world. And the first object he ever purchased was uh, of the, from the Islamic world. It was um, a beautiful Quran with just amazing illumination. And it's actually featured in our upcoming uh, guide to the collection. So stay tuned for that. Uh, he purchased a lot of these things through dealers such as Dikran Kalikian and Maurice Naaman who had connections to the Islamic world, but he also traveled there himself. Henry went to Istanbul and Cairo, so he would have seen Islamic art and architecture in person. That's great to hear that he actually had a connection and he didn't kind of like pass off that job to someone else, that he was really yeah. enriched by that work and how he collected. Mm -hmm. Um, can you get into a little bit with us? Uh, how did you come to study textiles? What was your entry point? Good, good story. So I actually came to studying textiles um, from the perspective of being a maker or an artist. Uh, for undergraduate, I went to the Kansas City Art Institute and studied art history and weaving. Um, so you can see a picture of me here from several years ago, weaving on a loom. Um, my own work really looked at um, the way color blends and interacts as the warp and weft intersect. Uh, so that's something that I, I was particularly interested in. Uh, but this, the technical and material understanding of textiles that I got from making them really then informed my academic study through graduate school and um, as I delved into the art of the Islamic world. And that's so interesting and such a treat for us to have someone that has both the technical background and the scholarly background. And I'm sure that studying both art history and textile making at the same time was, I'm sure, informative of your experience there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's curious for us, us newbies into in the textile field, is how we define a textile. Could you do that for us today? How do we define a textile? I, I love that as a starting point, really, because uh, the way we think about a textile, it seems so obvious, but it can actually get really complicated. So for sort of to distill it down, uh, a textile really starts with a, a material. So a fiber like cotton or wool, silk or linen, and then is manipulated through different processes like spinning, knitting, weaving to come up with a sort of planar, pliable, structure that can then be used in all sorts of ways. But the thing that I find the most interesting about textiles is how universal they are. Mm. Our bodies are in touch with textiles 
every day of our lives from the moment we're born really until the day we die. And it's just, I think, a really deep part of uh, the human experience. And I think that's what makes them the most important um, is because they come in contact with us at every every point in our life and in multiple different ways. Um, and I know that we have our first example here, which I think is really interesting, this Taraz fragment. Yeah. So today we're going to look at a couple of uh, textile fragments from the medieval Islamic world. Uh, here we have a ninth century Yemeni Tiraz fragment. Now, Tiraz is a word that comes from Persian, meaning embroidery. But there's no embroidery on this textile. Um, it actually then sort of transformed to mean anything with an inscription on it, specifically textiles with inscriptions on them. Um, but Yemeni tiraz are often um, inscribed on ikat fabric. And that's thank you for making those distinctions for us that are new to Islamic textiles, but also textiles in general about where they come from and uh, discerning between them and the different styles. You mentioned ikat. Let's dig into that a little bit. I think we have a close up of of that of the image of this fragment. What is ikat? <laughs> Ikat, some people might be familiar with this because it seems to have um, been popular lately in home decor and throw pillows and things like that. Um, but the process of ikat is really is a resist dyeing technique or kind of like a tie dyeing technique. Mm -hmm. But you're dyeing the threads before they're woven into the fabric. So here you'll see um, the evidence really of when the warp threads were bundled together and tied off. Um, so resisting that area and then would have been um, introduced into dye baths, one dye bath for each color. And then once the threads are put on the loom and then woven, you get this beautiful sort of gradiated color patterning. And as I said, this is really typical of Yemeni Tiraz fabrics, but you do find ikat kind of all over the world. And I love this this distinctive kind of close up shot because you really get an understanding of of what resist dyeing is and and how it wears over time because of that process. And another thing that I noticed is this gold lettering. What is the significance of the gold lettering? Of course, yeah. So um, the inscription is really significant for Taraz textiles, um, and then when it's in gold, it's all the much more important, right? Um, so inscriptions on Taraz really, um, whether or not they're meant to be read as such, can bear meaning and power, mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, blessing or baraka in the Islamic world. Um, when these kinds of inscriptions are on garments or things like that, as you're sort of wearing those blessings on your sleeve, as it were, or if you give a garment to another person, you're conferring it from one person to the other. Or if fabrics like this, which often were reused uh, for burial shrouds, you're really taking those blessings with you uh, into the afterlife. Wow, there's so many mediums in which it, it relates. And that actually relates back to what you were talking about as far as how us on, on any given lifetime experience textiles in our lives is that it has multiple different uses and meanings and, uh, and, and throughout our, our lifetime and even in our passing. Um, we have another example, I think is a really awesome example, uh, another fragment. If you could just uh, tell us a little bit more about this. So here we're moving a little bit forward in time and traveling up the Red Sea, which is a historical trade route, uh, to Egypt, medieval Egypt. Um, this fragment comes from the late Fatimid dynasty, which is a Shi dynasty based in old Cairo. Um, and the characteristics of this piece really just scream late Fatimid. So this color combination of the rich deep red with a mustardy yellow that kind of looks like gold, mm -hmm. um, the cursive style of the inscription, and also this pattern, these really intricate bands of patterning that almost look like interlacing. So I think we have a detail here as well to see okay. those, um, what looks like almost like interlacing ribbons woven into the fabric. And something you mentioned in preparation of us doing this talk today about textiles referencing other textiles. And I didn't know if you wanted to touch on that today. Sure, I mean, this is just sort of a, a pet love of mine, I guess. Um, I mean, the idea of interlacing as a decorative pattern um, predates Islam, surely. And, and you can see it on all different kinds of media. But when it's on a woven fabric, when you're weaving together 
elements that then depict elements woven together, there's that sort of self-referentiality that I find really interesting. I love that. And I also now will be looking at that always now in textiles <laughs> yeah. and how they might reference other textiles. It's a part of, uh, I think, textile history in which uh, things reference one another. But if we don't pick up on that, like if you didn't have that technical skill, I don't know if you would see it. Like it wouldn't be so blatant and obvious. Right. And I'm curious for you how you see, other than just visually, how these two pieces that you brought to us today differ from one another. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that they they come from they both come from the medieval Islamic world, Arabic speaking cultures. They're both Tiraz fabrics, but they look so different. The materials, techniques, colors, they're they're really different in every way. And I think that is just a a very small example of the absolute diversity and variety of Islamic textiles. So if we expanded our scope to look at the 1300 years of Islamic history and art production wow. from Morocco to India and around the world from different genders to minority groups to all different kinds of people and cultures. I think we would never exhaust the variety and beauty of textiles. That's, that's a wonderful uh, kind of call to action to kind of research and dig into these histories and narratives and cultures that make up such a diverse uh, part of the world that is, is Islamic cultures. Uh, we have a question from the audience, from Allison. Is the inscription painted on or woven into the fabric? That is a very good question. That is a very good question because I think it also comes back to the fact that Taraz is a word for embroidery, but the two inscriptions we're looking at, neither of them were embroidered. The one on the left is painted in gold onto the ikat fabric. But the, the one on the right, the inscription is woven, it's tapestry woven into the fabric itself. So neither of them are embroidered, even though they're still Taraz fabrics. And can you, if you, if you just want to touch on quickly about tapestry weave, like what is tapestry weave? How is it different than plain weave? As, and we're seeing this in the differences between the two. So Taraz, or sorry, tapestry weave is kind of a plain weave. So it is the sort of one-on-one, -on -one, over, under, over, under patterning. But it's packed differently so that tapestry is only showing the weft. You don't see both the warp and weft. Um, and that's why it's used to be able to construct pictures. So you'll see this a lot in um, European tapestries too, to be able to make sort of pixel by pixel, like weft by weft to construct a, a larger picture. And in this case, to depict interlacing. Thank you for indulging me. I think it's, yeah. just, um, it's so fascinating how complex uh, textile creation is, like you mentioned earlier. And if we don't have any other questions, um, I'll just take a beat. Okay, uh, I want to thank you, Ashley, for being here. Thank you so much for sharing uh, with us and, and being our guide, really, through this whole process and nerding out with me about textiles as we prepared for this. Um, Anytime. <laughs> great, perfect. <laughs> um, the, the medieval Islamic world, uh, now that we know, is has so many rich visual narratives. And I think it's really important that um, we had you on to kind of just touch the surface as far as the diversity that's available um, in our collection, but also throughout the world. Uh, hopefully this gave you all some newfound importance to these, uh, gave you some newfound importance to these objects and the centering of Islamic visual art throughout time. Uh, we hope this is a welcomed introduction to our textile collection and the stories that it can tell. Uh, we want to thank our Walters digital team for making this all possible here. And uh, we hope that um, you will come back and visit us once again. And last but not least, I just want to thank everybody here that came to join us today. And uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye.